All right, so U.S. Constitution. What I'm going to do is kind of give you a very broad introduction to it, look at the underlying principles of the Constitution, and then we're going to look, work our way step by step, spending just a few minutes on each of the major sections of the Constitution. I mean, it's a, it's a long document. We can't go into great detail on every nuance of it right now at the very beginning of the course, but we'll lay out different parts of it as we work our way through it, through the uh, rest of the class. In the big picture, the Constitution itself builds off the Declaration of Independence to set up a set of governmental institutions. If you recall from the other day, we said that the Declaration of Independence acted as a social compact, a statement of values and beliefs uh, that are related to the political environment. And so the process of actually setting up a governmental system reserved, was reserved until later. We had the initial attempt in the Articles of Confederation that failed for a variety of reasons. And so what we have now is the second constitution of the United States. The Constitution itself really does two major things. It outlines the interaction between the government and the governed. So we are governed by the Constitution, and we are governed by a government. And one of the key things to understand is that part of the role of the Constitution was not just to say the government has legitimate authority to govern the people in the United States, but it's also a limited government. So the government has some powers, but the Constitution also lays out limitations on what the government cannot do. And this was a really specific process for the men who wrote this document. They were very concerned about government becoming too powerful. Their experience under Great Britain led them to believe that governments tend toward tyranny. That if you don't have a restriction on what government can do, then government will try to acquire more and more power to itself. And so when they wrote the Constitution, they not only identified the powers that the government would have, but they also laid out restrictions about ways that the government could not act, what it could not do to restrict our freedoms. It also describes the relationship between the federal government, the government at the national level, and the government of the states. Because in our system of government, we are governed both by the national government with Congress and the president, and we're governed by our states with governors and state legislatures. So because you have these two layers of government in our whole system, the Constitution needed to kind of lay out what powers go to each one of those types of government. So they spent a lot of time actually talking about the Congress and what kind of powers it would have. Um, and basically what it does is it says all, everything that we didn't give to Congress, we're going to reserve that to the states. So the states have certain powers, but they're not all explicitly stated. The states, the, con the national government has the powers that are explicitly granted to it. So for example, in the Constitution, you'll find absolutely nothing mentioned about education. There is nothing mentioned about health care. There is zero stated about the environment. And yet the federal government's involved in that to a great extent. So a big part of the story about how the federal government came to be involved in those areas where it did not have any explicit authority is an important thing for us to understand as we look at our, our, at our history. Up until these things changed about the 1950s and 1960s, all of these areas, education was solely the responsibility of states. And the main reason is because the federal government had no authority to do anything about education working from the Constitution. Healthcare, the idea of Medicare, for example, and Medicaid that emerged in the 1960s, there is nothing in the Constitution that gives the national government permission to do those things. And so all of that was managed at the state level. The state governments did that. What happened is that a philosophy changed in terms of how do we approach this from a national level rather than a state level. And so we'll talk about that as we move forward. And then finally, we're going to see that the Constitution exerts and expresses itself as the supreme law of the land. This Constitution is the supreme law of the land. But one of the things that we don't often pick up is that in the statement, that same statement that identifies the Constitution as the supreme law of the land, 
there are two other things that are also listed as the supreme law of the land. And so these three things work together to govern us in terms of resolving conflicts and deciding which kinds of authority will accrue to the national government and be retained by it. The preamble of the Constitution establishes its overarching purpose. So how many of you had to memorize this when you were in school? Okay, Schoolhouse Rock Song. Anybody use that one? Yeah, that's the one that I use too. I was watching cartoons when I was, you know, in fourth grade, uh, and uh, this came on Sunday mornings and it, or Saturday mornings, and it helped me memorize the Constitution. We, we the people, in order to form more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, do and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. How many of you have a problem with this set of statements? Anybody disagree with any of these? I guess the thing that I'm wondering is how many of us define these terms the same way? Right, because when we look at something like, what does it mean to have a more perfect union? What exactly does that mean? More, per more perfect than what? Well, we're not supposed to achieve a perfect union. We're just supposed to be striving for something that's better than what we had before. Well, how, how good is that? What's our metric for making that happen? How many of you object to establishing justice? And what does that mean? What does, let's take a moment here. Audience participation. What does it mean? What does justice mean? Fairness, okay. Any different definitions? Justice being protection of certain rights. Okay, protection of certain rights. I guess like making sure people have done wrong at certain times or something like that. Yeah. A crim a just criminal justice system? Sure. Three different ideas. Kind of two big ones here, right? Fairness in terms of the way rights are allocated and a criminal justice system. So if you have in your mind that the purpose of government is to establish justice, what the government can do depends on how you define justice. If you define justice as fairness to everybody, then you're gonna propose a set of solutions to a different set of problems than somebody who defines justice as setting up a, a just system of criminal justice of crime and punishment. Two really different kinds of things. Right? All based off of two different definitions of established justice. Then we get to ensure domestic tranquility. What the heck does that mean? We're providing for the common defense. <clears throat> this seems fairly straightforward when we're talking about of uh, foreign powers, but what about domestic powers? What about promoting the general welfare? What does that mean, promoting the general welfare? Just by using the word welfare be after the post-1960s, that creates a whole lot of controversy, right? What did they mean when they were talking about general welfare? Securing lessons of liberty to ourselves. You know, we could probably create a set of rules that are really handy and effective for providing blessings of liberty to ourselves. The real intellectual challenge is to provide a system that's going to set up so that the people who are sitting in this class next period, in the period after that, and next semester, and next year, operating under the same set of rules, also are enjoying the blessings of liberty. Their goal was not, we're gonna do what's good for us today. They're thinking long-term. That's hard. Big picture introduction. That's where we're going to stop. All right. So then, as we're looking at the Constitution, the way that I want to approach this is not from going line by line through it, but to give you kind of the underlying foundational concepts that explain why it is the way it is. 
So when we look at what the founders were writing about at the time that they were creating the Constitution, we knew that they were, they were dealing with several underlying principles that helped them to make decisions about the Constitution. And these four principles are republicanism, federalism, separation of powers, and checks and balances. And the overriding idea for each of these concepts is that they are a way to protect liberty. They were a way to keep the government from being so strong that it overpowered people, but strong enough so that they would be able to function better, uh, and it would be able to function better than it had under the Articles of Confederation. And the fundamental idea here is that when you give government power, in order to keep the government from becoming too powerful, you have to spread that power out a lot. <clears throat> so you have to divide up the power that the government is naturally going to have. So you're avoiding it being concentrated in any one office, like the president. You don't want the president, you want the president to kind of be powerful enough to do what needs to be done, but you don't want the, the government, you don't want the president to be so powerful that uh, he becomes a tyrant. You want Congress to be powerful so that it can be more effective than it was under the Articles of Confederation, but not so powerful that it tramples individual liberties. So all these decisions that they made working from these four principles had to do with preventing the concentration of power in one body or in one person. Looking at each one of these in a little bit more detail. The first one is republicanism. Republicanism is the idea that power ultimately resides with the people, but when the people choose their elected leaders, they're delegating to those leaders authority to make laws. So the fundamental idea here is that the people give power. They select their, who their leaders are going to be, and the power then of the people is exercised by those representatives. At the same time that they wanted the people to exercise power, they were concerned because they believed that the mass public would be easily manipulated by politicians of low character. They would take charismatic leaders, for example, who wanted to pursue things that were bad policy. Uh, and so they wanted to protect the government and the, the whole country from the possibility that the public would select somebody who was really motivated more by self-interest uh, and not in the national interest. So their thinking was, we have the power of the people, we need to let them select the leaders, but at the same time, we think that people will be manipulated because they just don't pay that much attention to politics. So that led to a series of specific choices that they made. First, they made the point that you have direct election of the, of the House of Representatives. So we'll see this in a minute, uh, but the House of Representatives is the body that is most closely connected to the people. And we hold elections for the House of Representatives, and in each one of these elections, whoever gets the most votes wins, that person becomes the representative. So we directly choose who the president, I mean, who the representative will be for our geographic area. But the way that they mitigated the influence of the public, so they had the public with direct influence in the House of Representatives, the way they mitigated that influence was providing for indirect influence of the people on selection of the Senate and the presidency. So in the Senate, originally, the Senate was elected not by the people, but was selected by state legislatures. So that became an important part of the people electing their state legislatures and then the state legislatures electing the senators. So the people had a voice, but it was an indirect voice. It was mediated through the state legislature. Same thing happens with the president. In their concept, the people would elect representatives called the Electoral College, and then the Electoral College would then select the president. So the people have a voice, but the, that voice is mediated by the Electoral College. Now, that's one of the areas that didn't work out quite the way the founders expected. They expected that the Electoral College would be a series of wise kind of elders in the community. They would be people who would be put party above politics, who put the national interest above state interest. 
didn't work out that way. So 30 or 40 years later, it turns out the Electoral College, the people who get there are really just diehard party loyalists rather than people who are going to put the nation's interests ahead of party. So that did not work out the way the founders expected, but their mindset in the writing at the time was, we're going to have this people who elect these representatives who will then select the president and they'll make a better choice than the people would themselves. And then finally, federal judges would also be elected very indirectly. The people elect the, the, the state legislatures who then select senators. The people elect the electoral college who then select the president. And then the president and the Senate jointly select federal judges. So the people's voice gets heard but it gets mediated through other institutions in order to limit the possibility that the people will make bad or immoral choices. The second major principle under which the founders were operating is federalism. Federalism is the guaranteed division of power between the national government and state governments. And the idea here is government is going to have a lot of power. So in the Constitution, they said these powers will go to Congress and the president. All the other governance powers that the government might act on, we're going to give to the states. So they took all the power that people under which people might labor, and they gave some of that power to the national government, and they gave some of that power to the state governments. The idea here is you keep both parties, the national government and the state governments, having power in their own spheres, but competing with each other. And if the two people who have power have constitutionally protected power, then that conflict will keep both of them from becoming too, too powerful and too strong. So what we see is that in the Constitution, the way this principle works out is that they specifically grant powers to Congress and they specifically leave the rest to the states. And they thought that they were doing this in a fairly clear way. Moreover, they said it's not just the people who need representation in the government because the people are not the only ones that are, that are affected by the government. We also want to give representation to the states. And so the states themselves had their own set of representatives, and that was what the purpose of the Senate was. The reason the state legislatures could choose who the senators were going to be is because the states had to have representation in Congress as well. So really what you have in Congress is not only representation of people in the popular opinion, public opinion kind of way, but it's also representation of the states that's taking place in the Senate. Now these dynamics have changed over the years, but this is the fundamental purpose of the reason we have equal representation in the Senate and population-based representation in the House. That's why we end up with that kind of division. It's a function of the idea of federalism. And you can see in this process the intersection between the belief in republicanism, the people have a voice, and the belief in federalism the states also need a voice. And both the people and the states need protection from a very powerful central government. Questions or thoughts about that before we go on? Okay. Okay. Two more basic principles. Separation of powers. The concept of separation of powers is that you take the powers of the government and you intentionally divide them across the branches of the government. So you give some powers to one branch and other powers to another branch. And the idea here is that you're distributing power instead of concentrating it. And in order for the government to do anything big, the branches have to cooperate. And so in the big picture, the Constitution gives three, has the, identifies three separate sets of responsibilities for, related to the law. 
and it allocates the responsibility to the three different branches. The lawmaking, that is writing the laws, is given to Congress. They write the bills. The House and the Senate have to agree exactly on the same language in order for a bill to pass. Once a bill is passed and signed by the president, the responsibility for actually implementing the bill, that goes to the president, to the chief executive. If you look at the word executive, the root word for it is execute, as in put into effect. Right, so the responsibility for doing what laws say the government should be doing is given to the executive. And then interpreting the law, evaluating whether laws uh, are contradictory or evaluating whether laws violate the Constitution, that's given to the judiciary. So three different ways of approaching the law, creating the law, implementing and enforcing the law, and then interpreting the law are given to these three different branches. But if we're going to have a new law, the two of the three branches at least have to coordinate their activities, and the third branch could overturn it if they exceed their boundaries. So if they do something they're not allowed to do, then the, the federal judges can say, you can't do that, that violates the terms of the Constitution, so we're gonna strike that law down. All three of these pieces are important, but they're all designed to spread out the power and encourage cooperation. A counterweight to separation of powers is checks and balances. Checks and balances extend out of the belief, the framers, that the people who go into politics need somebody watching over their shoulder. You can't really trust them. You need them, you need people in power, but the kind of people who are going to go into government and acquire power are the kind of people you want to be suspicious of. So if somebody is really, really power hungry, you might let them have power, but you don't want to let them have unchecked, unobserved power. So the idea is that you took each branch of government, it has a certain set of powers, and then you give the other branches the chance to stop it in its tracks. So when we think about Congress passing a law, if the president does not like a law that Congress passes, the president can say no, it's called a veto. That's an example of Congress, be, the president being able to stop Congress. And if Congress overwhelmingly still favors that, then they can override the president saying no. It's a way of having some balance in the system to keep the, the, the branches of the government competing and overseeing each other. So this shows up in the Constitution in a variety of ways. A handful of these have to do with the ability of Congress to investigate the president and investigate the executive branch. If the president is corrupt, or if an executive branch is doing something wrong, Congress has the ability to hold hearings and investigate whether or not that's, that uh, accusation is true or not. So for example, there's a question about whether Donald Trump owning or leasing a, uh, a building from the federal government that he makes into a hotel, and then he makes money from the guests in that hotel. The question is, is that allowed? Is that a corrupt practice? So one of the things that the new Congress is going to do is investigate whether that process of owning the Trump International Hotel just down the hall, just down the road from the White House, is a form of corruption. And they can do that because Congress is given the power to investigate what's going on in the executive branch. Or when the Secretary of the Interior is spending extravagant amounts of money and misusing public funds, Congress has the ability to investigate that and see what's going on, and see whether those laws are being broken. You only have that in a system in which those checks and balances are incorporated into the system. Right? If there are no checks and balances, then there's no stopping an executive from doing whatever the executive wants to do. 
You need to have somebody with the ability to investigate. Moreover, when the executive branch is responsible for implementing a law, so let's say Congress passes the Clean Water Act, and then it says, all right, Depart uh, Department of Energy, you're responsible for taking care of the environment, and so uh, you then make a bunch of rules for implementing the uh, for implementing the Clean Water Act, then Congress has the ability to investigate and monitor how the Department of, of uh, Environment, Environmental Protection is doing in that job. Are they doing it right? Are they doing it wrong? Are they fulfilling what the Congress wanted them to do? So they get not only to investigate, but they get to oversee the implementation of the laws that they passed. And if the executive branch doesn't do what Congress wanted, then you end up with a conflict. And there are penalties that can be paid. The executive branch, as we said, can veto bills, can refuse to spend money. Sometimes Congress gives the president responsibility to do stuff that it doesn't want to do. So, for example, we see this in a lot of the, the questions about how, about the DACA program, for example, where child, people who are children, when their parents brought them into the United States illegally, what do we do with those kids? What do we do with those kids as adults now? And the program that Barack Obama established was called the DACA program, Deferred Action for childhood arrivals. And it set up a specific program for not necessarily punishing people who were brought here by their parents' will when they didn't have any authority to do anything. But Congress didn't pass that law. Congress said, President, you get to manage this stuff. It's too complicated for us. Or maybe we don't have the courage to do it. Or maybe we can't get it passed. We're going to give you authority to manage this. So President Obama said, all right, here's a new program, DACA. Donald Trump not violating any laws, said, I don't like that law, so I'm going to change it, and I'm going to stop it. And he had the authority to do that because Congress gave him the authority to do that, the same way they gave Barack Obama the authority to make the program in the first place. If the laws that get passed are, violate the Constitution, then the judiciary can say, you can't do that, and they can overturn the law. And then finally, Congress and the president have the ability to shape what the judiciary looks like because they choose who the judges are. So they can choose people that match their ideology or their particular constitutional interpretation. Questions? Yes? Um, what did you say it was that chooses the judiciary? The president nominates oh. people to be federal judges. And then in order for them to be actually serve as federal judges, the Senate has to have a vote to approve them. So it's a joint, joint action. 